As you've all seen, this is an amazing cast for the film, and we're very excited to have them here. So without further ado, please help me welcome Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Josh Gad. Luke Evans. Emma Watson. Dan Stevens. Bill Condon. Audra McDonald. And welcome back to the stage, Alan Menken. Good. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. Congratulations on the film. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. You know, the animated <coughs> movie is, for so many people, their favorite film of all time. Yes. Uh, so when you approach adapting it for a live action, sort of what was the process for you? Get over the terror first, I think, you know. <laughs> um, but then, you know, you just start with that basic idea. You're going to take it into a new medium, which is live action. They're going to be actors. Emma, Emma's going to be playing a character in, on real locations who has to fall in love with the beast. So all the behavior, which is, you know, let's face it, an animated film is, is sort of, you know, a little more exaggerated, has to come into reality. And that, once you start to investigate that, then you realize, wow, there are questions maybe you never asked before that you want to know about. How did Belle and Maurice wind up in this village where they're outsiders, you know? Um, and that leads to then new songs, and mm -hmm. suddenly you're creating something new. Yeah, yeah, we had these discussions. For me, sorry, you didn't ask me the question, but um, <laughs> when Bill came aboard, we had meetings about what what we what, what would we add, and one of the things we talked about the music box moment mm. and Maurice and, and getting into the backstory of how Maurice and Belle came to the town and backstory for the Beast, how he became such a cold and callous young man, and also trying to root ourselves much more in time and place, 18th century France, and that really helped immensely. Mm. Well, Alan, working off that, you know, this is one film of a myriad of films that you've contributed amazing music to. I mean, it's sort of impossible to capture how much you've given people, you know, with the work you've contributed to these films over the years. And I'm curious what you think it is about them that makes them such universal stories for so many people. You mean all of them? Just, the, I mean, you can talk about this film specifically. If you want. Let's go one by one. Alan. We're gonna get started. That. I mean, when I, you know, when I first came to Disney, I got to say, I thought of Little Mermaid. First and foremost, as Howard Ashman and my uh, follow-up to Little Shop of Horrors, <laughs> um, it was we were still working in you know for me with working in musical theater, you know, at least these off 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 Broadway guys um, coming and bringing our our skills to Disney, um, and uh, I didn't we, we don't calculate beyond telling the story and serving the characters and trying to give each each of these projects its own unique musical stamp, um, and beyond that it's just storytelling, and you know, and it's there's you know there's no more collaborative form than musicals. So, you know, I know we call it musicals, and we're, I'm the composer. But the truth is, it's a director, it's a choreographer, it's a it's a lyricist, it's a book writer, it's it's a composer, it's an orchestrator, it's an arranger, it's a lighting designer, it's everything put together. So I think I benefited a lot also from the Disney Association, obviously. Absolutely. The films in general really speak to children in such a wonderful way. And Audra, I'm curious, as a parent, what do you like about what this Beauty and the Beast says to kids? Um, many things, but one thing that was really important to me, I mean, I said yes the minute that Disney called, because you say yes when Disney calls. So if they, they told me to, you know, we're going to sell churros in the park, I'd be like, yeah, I'm there. You know, it doesn't matter to do it. But, um, uh, Knowing not only did it have this incredible creative team, but that Emma Watson was going to be uh, Belle, um, and knowing how how much Emma has affected girls of my daughter's age, and 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 my daughter is someone who now asks for people to donate money to charities for her birthday gifts instead of instead of presents, and that's because of you, Emma. Mm -hmm. And so knowing full well <laughs> it is. And knowing full well that Emma was going to make sure that Belle was somebody who was independent, who was strong, who was educated, who was sticking up for, for mm. girls and women, um, and uh, who does all the rescuing in the film. <laughs> I, that, that's why I knew it was going to be important for um, me to be a part of and, and for my kids to see. 
Absolutely. Well, Emma, Audra brings up an excellent point. You know, you've become a role model to so many young girls and women all over the world. And I know that growing up, Belle was someone you sort of uh, looked up to. When you, attempt, when you sort of uh, began to sort of make her your own, what were sort of the things that you thought about in modernizing Belle? You know, it's uh, just to start, I mean, it's really remarkable to play someone that I'm almost sure had an influence on the woman that I have become. I think, you know, watching Paige O'Hara sing uh, Belle Reprise, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the I want song of all I want songs. <laughs> and I just immediately resonated with her, um, this, I, you know, I didn't, I, I mean, I was so young, I didn't even know what I was tapping into, but there was something about that spirit. There was something about that energy that I just knew she was my, she was my champion. And um, I think when I knew I was taking on this role, I wanted to make sure that I was championing that same spirit, those same values, um, that same young woman that, that made me a part of, you know, a part of who I am today. And so, you know, every time we would address um, a new scene that, that Bill or um, Steve or Evan um, had, had put together, uh, you know, I just kind of went, I, I just always had, had the original DNA, DNA of that woman in mind. And, and I, and I, you know, and I had my fists up, you know, I was ready, ready to fight because she was, she was so crucial for me. And, and, um, you know, it was, it was just taking what was already there and, and just expanding it. And I love that in our version, um, Belle is not only you know, kind of odd and doesn't fit in, and you know, you see her, her reading and you see her not really a part of the community. In our film, uh, she's actually an activist within her own community. Um, she, she's teaching other young girls who are part of the village to read. And, you know, moments like that where you could see her expanding expanding beyond just her own little world and, and trying to kind of grow it, I thought um, I, loved, I loved that. And uh, I, I, yeah, that was, that was amazing to get to do. Uh, you know, I think in bringing this to life, one of the, probably the biggest challenges would be creation of the beast because, you know, he's such a huge player. The physicality has to be so intense and large and specific. And I mean, I think the film does an amazing job and Dan, you do an amazing job with that as well. And I'm curious sort of, when you approach that, you know, there's so much there, there. You know, there's the face and the costume and the height. But, I mean, did you approach playing him any differently than you would sort of, you know, any other character you've played? Well, it, it was a very physical engagement. I think just to support that muscle suit on stilts was a challenge that I'd never really encountered before. Um, I've definitely been taking a more physical approach to my roles in the last few years and, and just training myself. In, in different ways. I think with the backstory, we decided that the prince, before he was the beast, was a dancer, that he loved to dance. And so I trained myself like a dancer and learned you know, three quite different dances for this movie and worked very closely with Anthony, just in terms of the, you know, his, his general deportment, um, both for the prince and the beast. You know, and there was, a lot of, there was a lot of work dancing in stilts. Um, and getting to know Emma, first and foremost, on the dance floor was probably, you know, I think it's a great way to get to know your co-star. Uh, and I'm going to try and do it with every movie I do now, whether there's a waltz in the movie or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, the, the, the trust that Emma had to place in me that I wouldn't break her toes. And, and also, it, it really became part of the, you know, that sort of crucial part of the title, really, the and the bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that sort of the, the essence of a waltz being two people in this, in this whirlwind, um, you know, and, and learning about choreography, really, the, the storytelling through dance, not just getting up and dancing, but actually, you know, really, really telling a, a very crucial part of the story and that, that big turning point. So, yes, lots of physicality. <laughs> um, you know, when you have the title Beauty and the Beast, there is someone trying to keep those two apart. And Luke, that is Gaston. Uh, someone once said that, you know, villains never think of themselves as the villains in the story. They always think of themselves as the hero. And I'm sure that's especially true with him. Um, I, I'm curious. I mean, what did you sort of clue into in his past or in building the character that made him more than a villain to you? Well, <clears throat> I just think... A villain shouldn't start out as the bad guy. A, a villain should end up being the bad guy. And I think with Gaston, outwardly, you know, to a lot of people in that village, he is the hero. 
he's a bit of a stud. You know, he's got the hair, he's got the looks, he's, got, he's always impeccably dressed. Not a bad singing voice. <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he's got a great pal who makes everybody, uh, you know, support him and sing about him. And I wanted the audience to, in a way, I just thought, let's make them like him a little bit first. Um, so that when the, uh, the cracks start to appear, which <clears throat> they do very subtly, even from the door slam, you know, there's something inside of him that he's like, I'm not used to this. This isn't, mm -hmm. this isn't how it goes, you know, this is not what she's supposed to be doing. And although he keeps believing that Belle will change her mind, that's where the cracks appear in my thought process. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, you know, the, the jealousy takes over and, and, and who he becomes, especially Gaston, as opposed to other Disney villains, he has no book of spells, he has no magic powers. He's a human being and he uses his status within that village to rouse a crowd and, and uh, he does it all from just being himself, which is quite terrifying in a way. <laughs> And um, so I played on that. I played on the humanity of the character as much as he is larger than life. There was a lot to, to pull on. And obviously, he was a, a war hero of sorts. We decided, didn't we, Bill, from the, from the past? That's why his murals are all over the pub that he drinks in. Um, and there is a slight soldier, this animalistic soldier in him, when he finally fights the beast mm -hmm. on, the, on the rooftops. You see this man out for, for blood. And, uh, it's a scary moment to see the arc of somebody who was the lovable buffoon of the village to become the absolute, the beast, almost, the monster. Absolutely. Uh, Josh, we've seen you on Broadway, we've seen you in other musicals. We know you're very adept at singing and doing comedy. Uh, in this film, you get to ride a horse. Um, how, was, how was the horse back riding for you? Can I get Audra's question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm going to get comfortable for this. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, I learned a couple of great lessons on this movie. Um, one of which is that Jews don't belong on horses. <laughs> um, specifically overweight Jews. Uh, I... My horse um, was an anti-Semite. <laughs> he, um, interestingly enough, uh, they would call action. And the horse that they told me was trained for this movie, but I believe they found in the wilds of England. <laughs> um, Luke's, Luke and I, our first entrance into the village of Villeneuve, was to, this picture, by the way, is gonna be so out of context. <laughs> People are gonna be like, what is for sitting like that? Um, but <laughs> I have very short legs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Luke, Luke and I are walking into the village on our horses and on action, all our horses need to do is walk side by side. It's, it's so simple. Luke's horse does it. The two of them worked on The Hobbit together three months <laughs> a year, have this incredible background. We share a trailer. Mm -hmm, they share a trailer. Um, uh, mine is a cold-blooded killer. And he m proceeded to moonwalk. Uh, he walked backwards. <laughs> then he ran through multiple extras uh, in the village ran around, I didn't even know it was possible, but ran through these like pillars around, up and back again. I heard cut and I heard laughing. And the laughter was coming from the horse's trainer. Uh, and he came up to me and he goes, I'm so sorry, I've never seen this happen before. <laughs> and it was so sad. It made me feel so awful about myself. Ironically, my horse's name was Buddy. Uh, that is a true story. He's nobody's buddy. Uh, I'm begging Disney to press charges against him. And I've told my agents to never send me another script with a horse in it again. And unless that it's is on wheels. Unless it's on wheels. In the sequel to Beauty and the Beast, I drive a DeLorean. I'm liking these ideas. Well, I'm glad you're safe in here with us yeah. today. Um, 
Gugu, I want to ask you, you know, one of the films, one of the most impressive things I think the film pulls off is it makes you really empathize and care about these inanimate objects. You know, I mean, they're not inanimate, but they are objects. Um, and for me, I think one of the most emotional moments of the film is when the curse is taking them over at the end and you're watching them say goodbye to one another. I mean, doing the voice work with that, I mean, how do you inject so much emotion into something, you know, into a feather duster? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was it was an interesting challenge, and I was, I, you know, I was so obsessed with the original Disney film. You know, it came out when I was eight years old, so I was kind of really excited to be a part of this. And for me, it was, you know, working on the French accent. You know, um, both myself and Ewan uh, had the same uh, dialect coach, and then just playing in the studio with Bill, encouraging us to, you know, embrace that sort of inner child and that real sort of let's pretend kind of freedom. And um, for me, you know, having done a few serious roles that year, you know, to be able to embrace the feather duster plumet and to also be able to really not be limited by your own face and your own body mm. that you can really, as I say, just play. Um, was was so mm. joyful. And then again, when we all got to, you know, be on set for that transformation sequence and all these legendary actors are there and, you know, to, um, to be swirling around that Disney ballroom, it was just um, really, really magical. Absolutely. We're going to open it up to your questions in a minute, but before we do that, Bill, I have one last question for you. Sure. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the sexuality of LeFou this oh, week. Right. Uh, right. How do you feel about that? I'm going to well, go use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, you know I, I talked before about how we translate this into a live act. That, that means filling out the characters. It's also a translation to 2017, you know? And what is this movie about? What has this story always been about for 300 years? It's about looking closer, going deeper, you know, accepting people for who they really are. And in a, in a very Disney way, we are including everybody. I think this movie is for everybody, and on the screen you'll see everybody. And that was important to me, I think, to all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And with that, we'll go to your questions. If you just raise your hand, I think we have some mics. We can start right here in the, f oh, or there. How do you feel about, you know, how we put a value on knowledge in society? Um, gosh, <laughs> where to begin? I mean, I think, um, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that Belle is this ultimate kind of symbol of the fact that books can be um, rebellious. Uh, they can be incredibly empowering, uh, liberating. Um, they are a means to travel, to, 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 you can travel to places in the world that you, that you would never be able to, um, you know, under other circumstances. Um, and I, I, you know, again, I was just really proud to play a character that, uh, that, you know, she has a certain earnestness about her, honestly. She, she, um, and, and she's not in any way kind of ashamed of that or, and it's not easy being an outsider and um, it's, it's not easy to pick battles, it's not easy to, to try to move and work against a system, to, to work against the grain, to move against the status quo. Uh, <clears throat> but, she, but she does so with um, kind of this amazing fearlessness and, um, uh, you know, with the support of, of her father, but, but really I think it's, it's something that she weathers on her own, really, at the end of the day. And um, yeah, it's just a, it's, I just feel, I'm very grateful that, um, that this character exists and, and that I, I, I get to bring her to life. It's, it's fantastic. I hope I did an okay job of <laughs> answering that. But. Thank you. For our next question, I think it's here. <coughs> And this question is for everybody. It's kind of a legend that the beast name's actually Adam, <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> um, the animators and everybody have said that. I'm over here. <laughs> and so I was wondering what you guys would name him if you could name the prince, because <laughs> his name is not Adam. <laughs> I'd name it Prince Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Adam. He's not called Adam? Adam. 
I didn't know that. Oh, I called Dan for most of the movie. I just called him Beastie. Beastie. <laughs> Hi, Beastie. Beastie. <laughs> so I, <yeah>. Sorry. <clears throat> I would name him Vladimir because I want to make friends with the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I think our next question is right here. Hi, my question is for Bill and Alan. Um, I wanted, I'm right here. Hi. Hi. Got it, got um, it. I wanted to know about, uh, you mentioned songs as storytelling devices. <clears throat> um, working with Stephen and Evan kid to organically incorporate these into the film, how did that, how did that process work? How right. did you go about doing that? Well, you know, the, um, uh, uh, let's take one example instead of talking about all of them. The, the, the song Evermore, the song for the beast, you know? So <clears throat> this is, you know, they often say in musicals that people sing when they can no longer, when it's no longer enough to speak, you know, that their emotions are running so high. There's, I think it's one of the dramatic high points in all of literature, you know, the fact that, that the beast at this moment that he gives, give, lets, lets Belle go becomes worthy of love, you know? And, and discovers what love is, but at the same time, sacrifices his future, you know? Yeah. And, and um, so we talked about the fact that we needed a song. Right. And of course, there had been a song in the stage adaptation. In the Broadway show, there, there was right. a song called If I Can't Love Her. But you know, each, each iteration of Beauty and the Beast is, is a different medium in a way. It is an animated musical, there's a stage musical, and there's this. And they all have sort of different shapes. And a stage musical is definitely a two-act structure. Right. So we wrote this song for the Beast because at that act break is the moment where the Beast, out of anger, has driven Belle away. And it was important. We needed that, at that moment for the Beast to sort of howl for redemption or just say, I've given up. Um, but in the structure of a live action film, which is more of a three-act structure, Bill felt, and I, I agree with him, that the, be that the more satisfying moment is the moment when the beast lets Belle go because she's no longer his prisoner. And he loves her, and the spell will not be broken now, but at least he knows what love is. But was the question about that song, or was it about, in general? Just in general, how yeah. you work with Evan and uh, Stephen to incorporate these songs and... Well, it wasn't, so <coughs> yeah, wasn't so much them. It was, honestly, it was us sort of working out the moments yeah. that we wanted to musicalize, and, uh, yeah. But, you know, first of all, you know you have the initial tent pole moments from the animated right. movie, and that's, those are going to stay. And then what we do is as you put them in place, mm -hmm. you, you look at it it's like an architecture. Where do we need the, the emotional support? Sometimes the songs will respond to a moment. Sometimes you'll go, I feel like we need a song in this spot, and we, we will massage the story so a song mm. can fit there. I mean, it's not an e I could spend five hours talking <laughs> about that right, this right now, but right. essentially a lot of a lot of thought and a lot, again, mm -hmm. use the word collaboration, a lot of collaboration goes into what song is going to come, where is it going to go, what does it need to accomplish, and how will it inter interact with the song that preceded it and the song that came after it, what will be the overall effect of it, what character is underrepresented in songs, you know, and yeah. so many factors. Hello, uh, my name is Cassandra Shaw from LA Times High School Insider. So this movie has the theme of not feeling like you quite belong. I mean, Belle feels that, the Beast feels that. Um, specifically for Emma, uh, as a person who is on the verge of uh, going to college, what is your advice for dealing with those feelings of being an outsider and feeling like you don't quite belong? Gosh, um, I think what's difficult about the microcosm occasionally of school or sometimes colleges and universities is that you feel that the people that are in your immediate surroundings are the only people in the world and that you know that I remember feeling at school that you know if <coughs> if I didn't fit you know I, I there was nothing else and um, that's a really difficult feeling, but I guess what I would say for anyone that feels like an outsider in their environment, there is a big wide world out there with, with so many uh, different people with diverse opinions and perspectives and interests. And go out there and find your tribe. Go find the, your kindred spirits. And they do, they do exist. They don't necessarily come easily. 
pursue the things that you love and that you're really passionate about, they'll be there. But don't give up. They are there. <laughs> I believe our next question is right over here. This, uh, this question right here is for any of the actors that want to comment. We all have these songs permanently in our brains, but when you look at them, they're very challenging. The turns of phrases are amazing. They're in character. There's a lot to these songs. So if anybody wants to talk about when they realized, oh, I've got to work on this song or this lyric or this turn of phrase, like, does anyone have stories of like realizing, okay, this is, this is not as easy as we think it is? <laughs> I, um, I remember first getting the call, and I, <laughs> I immediately flashed back to being a kid. I was 10 years old. It was 1991, and I saw the, th the movie in a small theater in South Florida. And I remember that the, the response was something I had never seen before, which was audiences applauding after these animated characters were singing these songs. That was very unusual. Um, uh, prior to that, like the great mouse detective didn't have much applause when I saw this <laughs> in the theater. Um, so, and, and the black cauldron certainly did not. So, you know, um, what Ashman and Mencken brought to the Disney library was hearkening back to a, a, a time of the Sherman brothers, yeah. of, you know, the early days of Disney, and that was. For us, that was so a part of our childhood. Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, and Aladdin, I cannot tell you how important that was. So I got nauseous. I was like, how am I gonna bring a song like Gaston to life? And I went into my office, and I started singing it, and I literally started choking up. Because you cut to like yourself as a kid, you think back to yourself as a kid, and you're like, oh my God, I'm doing this, like I'm doing this for real. And I'm gonna be the version that a lot of kids are going to see. And that was such a thrill. And my kids walked into the office and were so tickled that daddy was singing this song that they know so well. And I thought to myself, this is, this is gonna work. This is gonna work, we're gonna work at it, but we're gonna make it our own. And it was that first day that we did the table read that I remember watching Luke perf perform the choreography for Gaston. It took me a little longer to get it. <laughs> and Emma um, performing Beauty and the Beast and Emma Thompson performing the song and all of these pieces coming together before our eyes. And I don't think there was a single one of us who didn't have goosebumps. <clears throat> And wasn't immediately like, and of course, Audra, you know, singing is like pr for a private concert. Like, <laughs> that is like yeah. the stuff that dreams are made of. I think also, um, the, an animated film was perfect. So I don't think Disney or anybody up here or anybody involved with this live action film was like, we gotta fix no. Beauty and the Beast. No. So I, I think. In that way, the pressure was off. I think it was just, let's reimagine it now. Let's, let's tell this particular version. But, but, so in that way, the pressure was off. We weren't, none of us were trying to, I, I certainly wasn't trying to be Joanne Worley. You, you weren't trying to be Paige O'Hara or Robbie Benson or any of the characters. It was like, now it's, now it's our turn to tell the story, this incredible story that's been told for 300 years. But in that sense, I think the pressure is off a little bit. As a tag onto that, my mantra throughout the whole thing is don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for myself. That's <laughs> cool. Well, with that, I think we have to say thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to all of you for thank this you. film and for being here today.